department government of gujarat following the oro traditions to invoke the blessings of the divine i would request everyone to please close their eyes for guru vandana and would request the it team to play the guru vandana To mark the joyous beginning of this event, I would like to invite our esteemed guests and dignitaries on the stage for lighting of the lamp. I would like to invite Sri Rajiv Chandra Shekhar Ji, Sri M Nagarajan Ji, Sri Prabhu Bhai Vasava Ji, Sri Suresh Mathur Ji, Professor Amrish Mishra Ji, Dr Monica Suri Ji, and Mr Sandeep Sharma Ji. I would request Mr Suresh Mathur acting provost and chief operating officer Oro Hotels and University 
and Professor Amrish Mishra, Registrar Oro University, to please honor and felicitate Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar Ji. I would request Mr. Suresh Mathur and Professor Amrish Mishra to felicitate Prabhu Bhai Vasava, Member of Parliament, Badoli. I would request Mr. Sandeep Sharma and Dr. Kiran Singh to please felicitate Sri M. Nagarajan, Commissioner Higher Education. I would request Dr. Monica Suri and Mr. Vishwas Devkar to please felicitate Mr. Hiran May Mahenka, CEO IHA. Under the able guidance of our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Bhai Modi ji, Government of India has launched the Startup India Action Plan to provide support to the student startups and technology. Oro University is proud and honored to organize New India for Young India Decade of Opportunities, an initiative by Government of Gujarat to fulfill this vision. This event is being organized in partnership with IHUB, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India, Digital India, Education Depart Department of Government of Gujarat, and SSIP under the AGs of Azadi Ka Amrit Mohatsav. Under this event, Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar Ji will interact with the students, startups, and innovators of Gujarat to inspire them to be the stakeholder of New India. In the words of our guest of honor himself, Startup India Action Plan by Prime Minister Narendra Modi has laid down the stepping stone of startup driven economy in New India and inclusive efforts and opportunities for all will transform this decade into decade. This event is being live telecasted on various social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter and Instagram handles of Oro University. On this note, I would like to invite Mr. Suresh Mathur, Acting Provost Oro University and Chief Operating Officer, Oro Hotels, to give his welcome address. Please, sir. Thank you so much. Aligning with the theme of the event, New India, for Young India, Decade of Opportunities on behalf of Oro University, it is my honor and privilege to welcome Shri, our chief guest, Shri Rajiv Chandrasekhar, Honorable Minister for Skill Development 
and entrepreneurships, electronics and IT. I'm also very fortunate to welcome today uh, Prabhu Bhai Lasana, Member of Parliament Lok Sabha, uh, 23rd <coughs> District, Bardoli, who is with us also. Uh, I welcome Mr. Nagarajan, IAS Commissioner of Higher Education, Gujarat, uh, Shri Irman Mohanpeji, CEO of IHUB, and other dignitaries on and off the dais. Professor Amrish Mishra, Rajshka University, and other dignitaries, faculties, alumni, beloved students, ladies, and gentlemen. Before I start, I'd like to interject and thank uh, the Honorable Minister for the time he spent looking at the exhibits displayed by our alumni and other students of all the innovation that they have created. Listening to some of the sound bites that he was advising students, I think uh, he gave absolutely wonderful and very exact advice as to how they need to brand their product. I was very impressed, sir, and sir, thank you so much for the time. Aurum University was established in 2011 under the vision of our founder, president, and chancellor, Sri Hashmuk H.P. Rama. It will, it will be very pertinent to note here that the Honorable Prime Minister, the then Chief Minister of Gujarat, Sri Nandabhai Modi, along with the late Sri Kirat Bhai Joshi, the, the then education advisor to the Chief Minister, inspired and encouraged uh, Mr. Rama to establish our university. Sri H.P. Rama also serves on the Prime Minister's Select Committee for the 150th birth anniversary celebrations of Shri Aurobindo, along with the Azadi Ka Amal Mahatsa. The university inspired by the vision and teachings of Sri Aurobindo Ghosh and the mother. At Auro, our vision is to be a premier university of integral and transformational learning for future leaders. Our philosophy is driven by our mission to nurture students as they develop from learners to leaders. We firmly believe that education must not be purely limited to academic learning. Hence, at Oro, our focus is to develop all faculties of an individual to ensure a holistic development, as also stated in the national education policy. At Oro, our focus is to develop all faculties of an individual to ensure both holistic development of the physical, mental, vital, and spiritual education. At Oro, we give a degree for life. Today, Oro has seven schools featuring over 30 doctoral, postgraduate, graduate, and skill-based scientific programs in business, hospitality, in collaboration with Marriott Hotels, law, information technology, in partnership with IBM, liberal arts, design, and mass communication and journalism. We have about 1,400 students and alumni of 1,800 graduates. We have over 75 faculties, and I'm proud to share the university has collaborations with more than 50 international universities and institutions on various aspects of academic excellence student research, curriculum development, faculty development, pedagogy, research, and knowledge transfer, etc. It is often stated, sir, by business and industry that in five years, a third of the skills that are deemed important in the workforce will change. Among the top 10 skills that will be required are creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, and a service orientation. None of these skills is effectively taught in universities. To address these issues, drawing upon the deep storehouse of wisdom that has long existed in India, we have drawn up a course which is unique 
to our university called the Science of Living. Here we share with students concepts, knowledge, and experiential practices that will help them unfold their full potential. Another unique course, Foundations of Indian Culture, is designed to help produce individuals who are confident of their Indian identity and yet prepared to engage with the world. To teach these courses, we have some of the finest people in the country, academics, theater people, and leaders coming together to create a learning environment like no other. The university is celebrating the 100th birth anniversary of Shiva Bindu, and a series of activities has been planned throughout the year under the auspices of the Shri Aurobindo Integral Life Center being constructed on campus. The center, when complete, will be the soul of our university. The center's goal is to foster inquiry and thinking in academia and community in the light of Shri Aurobindo's Integral World Vision. At the center, we want to nurture a community of scholars, teachers, thinkers, and writers engaged in disseminating the vision and works of Sri Ramit Aurobindo. We expect that the center would be dedicated to the city of Surat by January next year. Our beloved Prime Minister, Sri Nandabhai Modi, on Sri Aurobindo's birthday on August 15th, tweeted that Sri Aurobindo had a brilliant mind who had a clear vision for our nation. His emphasis on education, intellectual prowess, and valor keep inspiring us. Modiji also shared pictures of his visit to Pondicherry and the Chiraravendo Ashram. As our Honorable Home Minister, Sri Amit Shah spoke in Pondicherry that how the national education policy is based on the vision of Sri Aurobindo on integral education that emphasizes the need to train all teachers from schools and colleges in, edu in edu integral education conceptualized by Sri Aurobindo. The university is proud to take the responsibility in training these teachers through short-term programs in, ed in integral education in our center. It is suggested that the government may look into this possibility too. We have taken some unique initiatives in Gujarat. One such example is Parivartan Parshala, a skill development program, sir, where you just witness inmates of Lajput Jail in Surat. Under this program, our faculty and students conducted skill-based training sessions integrating physical, mental, vital, and spiritual aspects of human beings who are attaining higher consciousness and economy. Our university is also part of the student startups and innovation policy 1.0 and 2.0. We started our innovation and incubation center in May 2018, and the journey so far has been quite impressive. We are providing all kinds of assistance in startups and innovative ideas. The university has 153 startups, nine companies incubated here, mentors from reputed institutions, and many facilitations and recognitions for our students. The university has filed five patent applications, one GI application, and 23 more applications would be filed this year. Aura University is a Category A institution as recognized by SSIP. While most of the innovative ideas come from STEM sectors, but here are most of the ideas are from non-STEM fields. I believe we should focus a bit on tangible innovations and ideas from non-STEM fields like arts, humanities, and other allied domains. On, six, on, successful, on successful completion of phase one of this program, 120 inmates from, who are awarded merits of 
certificates of merit for their consistent and brilliant performance. One inmate who was part of the Excel skills program got placed in an IT company after his release from jail. He has become a role model for other inmates to participate and upskill themselves. In conclusion, I would like to say that Oro University provides a dynamic, energetic, and progressive learning environment to incubate our leaders of tomorrow. Our campus atmosphere inspires students to discover themselves and to realize the highest potential. Welcome to Oro University, sir. Jai Gauri, Gujarat, Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker on the dais, Sri M. Nagarajan, IAS Commissioner of Higher Education, Gujarat. Mr. M. Nagarajan is an IAS officer of 2009 batch, Gujarat Kater. Currently, he is working as the Commissioner of Higher Education, Gujarat State. He has a working experience of over 22 years in various government departments, including Indian Railways, Indian Audit and Accounts, and Reserve Bank of India and in the Ad Indian Administrative Service. He worked as a district collector in Arwali District, Gujarat, and contributed in bringing services delivery and industrial development of this tribal area. Later, he was the district collector of Kutch District, which is India's largest district in terms of area and is a very strategic location for India's defense. Prior to that, he was leading the Surat Smart City mission as CEO of Surat Smart City Development, under his leadership, Surat was awarded by Government of India for showing the highest momentum in smart city implementation. He is a member of expert group on IT and cyber security by Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India. Sir has made major interventions in health, education and rural development and he believes that technology can be a game changer in India's development. He has conceived and implemented projects in digital village, smart village, rural startups, rural broadband, smart cities, smart urban transportation, e-health and m-health for rural and urban communities. Sir has a master's in public policy and master's in economics. A bureaucrat by profession, he believes that technology is a great enabler of social change. He has been awarded by Election Commission of India for innovative use of technology in elections in the Gujarat 2012 elections. His projects have won major awards that include Scorch Award of Excellence, CSI Nihilant Award, Manthan Award, Financial Inclusion, Payment System Award. Sir has been chosen as District Collector Digital Champion 2014 and is an avid blogger and a startup mentor. We are honored to have you with us, sir, and I would humbly invite you to address this gathering of India's young minds. Please, sir. Very good, warm good evening to all. I am also here to listen to the Honorable Minister. But it's my pleasure to share some remarks, especially on this occasion. Because for me it is once again homecoming to Surat after some gap. And also to Aro University. In 2018 when the incubation was started, I have been there. So on this occasion, I think it's very momentous occasion for us that uh, Honorable Minister is here. He is uh, the Minister for Skill Development, Entrepreneurship and IT. The best part about him when I think is that he has been part of the team which you know created the Pentium processor and all that laid the foundation for revolution that we are facing, uh, that we are experiencing now and uh, that, that has touched so many lives and now he believes that to build a new India, we should talk to young India. That is why he is here today. I am glad to welcome him on behalf of Education Department to Gujarat, sir. I am sure that uh, uh, the dedicated and sincere students of our university will benefit from your uh, life story and the experiences and the vision that you will present to them today. I also heartily uh, welcome uh, Honorable MP Vasavasa 
he is a very person who takes a great interest in how to take schemes to the masses and he always keeps questioning even the very short interaction I had with him were very insightful I am glad to have him here. Thank you sir for joining us. So to just to share a few anecdotes about my experience with our university as I am here. I was in the festival of innovation five years ago and uh, I saw the first cohort and I am sure that would be the fourth or fifth cohort going on now. I am glad to see the uh, high level of uh, uh, mentorship that our faculties are able to provide because of the continuous experience providing. So that is the strength of Gujarat that there are academic ecosystem which focuses on skill development and entrepreneurship and uh, our faculties are attuned to how to mentor an idea which is not in the syllabus actually it has not so far it has not been there. So this model of student led innovation is creating the pipeline for startup India and digital India and today digital opportunities are providing you know, greater chances for all of us to make a big impact, especially in technology. And uh, that opportunity is well enabled as a, on the platter, I would say, by our university to the students. So I'm glad to see this kind of uh, great, uh, uh, you know, work going on. This year, the Student Startup Innovation Policy, a new version 2.0 was released. And there, the criteria were further relaxed. Today, even any youth who is even a dropout up to 35 years of age can, you know, get support for his ideas, get mentorship and all. Even one person, a student from one institute can be supported by another institute. And uh, there is a big amount of uh, cross learning and cross collaboration that is going on. And uh, Sri Madhur rightly mentioned that we should also focus on ideas that is coming up from the non-STEM sector. So our bias towards STEM focused uh, innovation uh, must be slightly changed that you don't need to be a techie to be an innovator. What you need is curiosity, creative thinking and uh, out of the box thinking and also focus on the problem and to get a relevant solution. I also believe that uh, once a product is innovated, say in any high-end technology, to take it to the audience, to take it to the target market and segment and customer, you need accounts, you need finance, you need management, all kinds of people. Also, when we are making an innovation, innovation for the sake of innovation or research for the sake of innovation is not going to deliver us any value that is enduring for the society, which is the ultimate goal of doing all the academics. So, finding the right problem statement to solve is very important factor. Yesterday, our Honorable Chief Minister launched a problem statement booklet where 775 problem statements from various government departments, industries, chamber, associations, have been collated and we'll also be sharing the soft copies with you all. So, uh, this kind of uh, problem statement compendium, I'm th I think, sir, it will be the, one of the largest uh, compendium in this country and uh, that means that youth have so many opportunities to solve all these uh, uh, problems. So, that presents another opportunity for Gujarat to help our students focus on it and uh, in the age group of 17 to 22, when a student is trying to be a entrepreneur, his idea should be taken to the market. So we are all here to facilitate your mind to market journey of how to take your innovation to the market and then patent it and also, um, you know, be an entrepreneur. Our vision for New India should be to create at least 10% of each cohort to be a job creator so that they can, uh, you know, engage the other 90% in their ventures, in their uh, you know, uh, they can be a job provider for them. That way we will be able to get the best benefit of the demographic uh, dividend and all. And for this Gujarat government, what they, they are doing with the community and ecosystem, we are all just the facilitators. And today we'll be having the inspirational speech of the minister is that we are providing the opportunities and hope for the next generation, which is very important for us. And I look forward to uh, and join, in joining you all to... Um, hearing about the uh, hearing the talk of the minister thank you very much for having me here thank you sir for those inspirational words mr ratan tata in one of his interactions very famously said if there are challenges thrown across then some interesting innovative solutions are found without challenges the tendency is to go on the same way the new and young India has taken these challenges and fought forward with innovative solutions and techniques. We at Oro University 
through our research innovation and incubation center headed by Mr. Sandeep Sharma, have always supported innovation and has helped many startups grow led by them. There would not be a better opportunity to recognize and honor them in the presence of a visionary leader like Rajiv Chandrasekhar ji, who is the flag bearer of innovation himself. I would request Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar ji to felicitate the creative teams behind some of the notable startups. In line with this, I would like to invite our first startup by Chef Arusha Rila. She owns a startup called Let's Wish, which started in year 2019 with an idea to serve premium and artisan desserts in the city. They also customize desserts as per the dietary requirements of the client. And currently, they are working on edible gifting options that are long lasting and easy to send across the country. We wish you all the best. I would now like to invite Ms. Nandini Sultania. She has a startup named Kamakya. Nandini launched her startup on 25th November 2018 and is now recognized under Startup India. In an urge to make difference to environment, she got a group of trainer doctors and volunteers together and launched Kamakya Movement on 12th January 2020. Now Kamakya India is a way of and distributed more than 20,000 reusable tags across the country, taken more than 15 sessions online and offline. Thank you, Nandini. Our next artup is by Ms. Dhviti Desai, called Frosting Layers. During her graduation, she discovered her passion for baking and started learning and researching about black rice. She started her business at small scale at home and after COVID, she changed her business model and started online baking workshops. Our next startup is by Mr. Vatsav Parikh called Bhumi. Bhumi aspires to bring transparency in real estate sector. And Bhumi converts the convention physical records into highly financial digital map that can be accessed using existing navigation apps like Google Maps. Next in line and our final startup is by Ms. Kushi Jen called The Food Mistress. They are home-based bakers and are registered with FSSI. From what started with a jar cage desert has now grown into full-fledged bakery that innovated with corn clay and jaggery cookies. We wish all the startups all the best in their journey ahead. Our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, in his 75th Independence Day speech, fondly remembered and paid tribute to Sri Aurobindo on his 150th birth anniversary <coughs> and emphasized on his philosophy of Swadeshi Se Swaraj, Swaraj Se Suraj. Oro University has been established on the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo and it aims to achieve the goals of Swaraj and Suraj through integral education. To realize this dream into reality, Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center at Oro University is launching a flagship master program that is MA in Integral Education. Integral Education is an education system and pedagogy based on Sri Aurobindo's vision of human future. This postgraduate Integral Education program not only aims for holistic development of the learner, but also includes all knowledge in its purview. Learners would conceive knowledge not only to fulfill human needs, but also learn about the soul in the world and its manifestation. On this August gathering, SAILC is also launching a book, Integral Education and Its Aspects in Practice. This book is inspired by all the talks and discussions on integral education taking place at the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center at Oro University. The purpose of all disclosure is a continuous and close reflection and discussion of the state of education currently and to discuss the path of integral education as one that can provide students with an understanding of all life as holistic and interconnected. I would like to invite Dr. Kiran Singh, Director Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center for the launch of the book and brochure of MA in Integral Education. A 
ICIC is dedicated to Sri Aurobindo and in realizing his vision and thought on integral life. The center's goal is to foster inquiry and new thinking in academia in the light of Sri Aurobindo's integral world vision. Our core learning and research areas include integral education, integral yoga, integral psychology, integral health and healing, and integral social development. I would also request Sri Chandrasekhar ji to launch the official website of SAIs. Under the visionary leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Bhai Modi, the Government of India launched the Startup India Action Plan. The plan focuses on various aspects of startup ecosystem and provides a launch pad and support system for young innovators and startups. Today, we have amongst us a visionary leader who closely and deeply understands the needs of startups and is the best fit to take this vision of creating startup ecosystem forward. It is my utmost honor and privilege to introduce to you the guest of honor for today's event, Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar Ji. He is the Union Minister of State in the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Sir has been in public service since last 16 years. He was born in Ahmedabad, Gujarat and studied at nine Kendri Vidyalayas across the country over 12 years of his early education. In his early years, he was handpicked by Vinod Dham to work at Intel as senior design engineer and a CPU architect on 80486 and Pentinum microprocessors. As a technology entrepreneur, he is known as one of the pioneers who built Indian telecom sector and established India's biggest cellular network in India. His telecom st startup, BPL Mobile, became a unicorn when the word unicorn was not even coined. With an experience of over three decades in technology, he is considered to be one of the leading minds on technology in India. As a minister, he has been advocating and leading the Digital India program launched by Honorable Prime Minister in 2015. Sir is also working towards taking forward mission vision of Prime Minister Narendra Modi on making India a global hub for ESDM electronic system design and manufacturing, especially through the newly launched India Semicon mission. Sir is working towards implementing Honorable Prime Minister's directions of designing a new approach to skilling, Skill India 2.0, to build on the gains of Skill India 1.0 and to transform India into global skills hub. I would request uh, Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar ji to join our students for a fireside chat and I would request all the dignitaries to please be seated in the front rows. It is a once in a lifetime opportunity to interact with Sir through a fireside chat and to know about his struggles as an entrepreneur. I would like to invite students of Oro University, Mr. Rohan Kamlani, Ms. Anjali Sharma, and Ms. Nandini Sultania for the fireside chat. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for giving me the stage to have a leading conversation with Sir. So, Sir, we would really like to have some conversation and more, like to know more about you. So, we'll go ahead with it. Okay, uh, so starting with your early life, how... 
<laughs> so, uh, could you just so throw some light on the insights or uh, about your academic journey and how was your childhood? So, I, I think I've said this many times uh, publicly. First, so first of all, thank you for all. Uh, thank you all of you for welcoming me. Uh, welcoming me here today this evening and I, I think we ran a little late with the startup so thank you for your patience um, look uh, I I wasn't a spectacular student in school uh, and uh, part of it was that I was maybe not as uh, focused or whatever you want to call it but uh, and, and maybe because I did a lot of different schools over the 12 years and um, uh, so I was, like I said, you know, most students go through life uh, being an average or a bar of a student. Uh, and I think I found my calling uh, in the early years of my engineering program when I discovered that there was a computer center in my college. And in those days, uh, I can't you know, even begin to describe what computer center in those days meant. It was a large one computer. Uh, and there's a long list of people who can take time on the computer for half an hour to program. So I discovered that and I found that I had a calling and a punch off for it and uh, and the rest as they say is history. Uh, great sir. So one more question from my side sir. Uh, we heard that you are very connected with the armed forces. So could you just say something about your connection with them and your share your views oh, as well? I am connected in the sense I am very connected because I am a son of an Air Force officer. And I consider myself a Fauji son, uh, and a lot of my approach towards public life and public service comes from having lived for many, many years with uh, men and women and families who consider service to the nation their primary mission in life. So there is a lot of that in my blood, there's a lot of that in my DNA, and uh, that is something that I have. Uh, in a sense, demonstrated even during my entrepreneurial business uh, journey, as well as my time in public, that I consider serving the and I consider public service uh, something very deep, uh, very, very, very. Uh, uh, it's a it's a matter of privilege, and it's something to, uh, not to be taken lightly. Yes, sir. So good evening, sir. I would like to know that one thing, uh, who was your constant motivation throughout the life or who is your role model and who kept you motivated throughout the life from your early stage? Very difficult to say that I had one role model, I, I didn't have one role model. Uh, at different stages in my life, different people inspired me. And uh, a lot of that depended on which path, which fork my path took. So, for example, for a long time when I was a technologist and when I was working in Silicon Valley, people like Andy Grove, people like uh, Bill Gates then, he doesn't inspire me anymore, but uh, he inspired me then. Uh, Steve Jobs, these are people who inspired me, not so much because uh, anything, but because of the maverick, uh, Christopher Columbus-like, hunt the idea down, hunt the solution down approach relentless type of approach towards innovation. Uh, and then when I came to uh, India and I started uh, the first mobile company, uh, one of the first mobile companies in India, uh, I was inspired by a gentleman called Craig McCaw, who was the pioneer of wireless in the US. And he was another slightly crazy guy because he, he, he really took, uh, and there's a book about him called Money Out of Thin Air. And he really pioneered the concept of Large scale cellular business model, business plans where every very any small uh, segment of the market the category. So different kind of people, and of course public life. I've been inspired uh, early on by uh, Adam G, and then of course now by our prime minister. So uh, in, in different times, different people have inspired me, and I think that's the way it should be. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for interacting with us. Sir, with the growing success rate of startup in India, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the potential of the youth of the country with this entrepreneurial ecosystem? And how was it different from your times and the current times? This is an uh, excellent question. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you can prepare with that, but it's a super question because 
I'll tell you why. Why these interactions, why we are all making this effort uh, to come out to you and engage with you. It's not that we don't have anything else to do. And we consider these engagements very important because the Honorable Prime Minister on April 15, 2021, from the rampart of the Red Fort, when he talked about 75 years of India, he talked about the next 25 years of India. And then he said something very powerful. He talked about the concept of India's decade. That is the next decade, which will be driven by technology. And then he went on to say something even more powerful, which is to say that the next, this India's decade, will be built by the energy, passion, determination, and success of India's youth. Now, if you line up that construct, that India has a great opportunity to be amongst the world's top economies in the world. India has the great opportunity to be one of the largest, most successful and vibrant startup innovation ecosystems in the world. India has a great opportunity in the next decade to be world, to create world-beating technology. And India will do A, B, and C on the back of the energy, the power, the determination, and the motivation of its youth. Then the whole construct falls to play, saying that this is not just about me or Vasavaji uh, or a few people saying that this is about the youth of India. It is the one person who has transformed India's landscape in the last seven years saying that I am investing in the future of India by investing in the youth of India. That is why this line, New India for Young India. So that is, that. I hope that establishes how important it is for us, for you to be convinced about this. This other point about startups and how defining startups are going to be to the future of India. I'll say two things today and I'm not pretending to be an astrologer or a, you know, a soothsayer. Digital is going to dominate the future. I'm not saying it's 100%. I'm not saying it's 80%. But a large part of the disruption, the large part of the economic expansion, the large part of the economic value add in all our lives, in all countries all over, is going to be digital. Aid. And startups and innovations are going to be the core of that. Why I say this, and I want you to understand this carefully, is that Ten years ago, when you talked about tech in India, you talked about Infosys, HCL, Wipro, TCS, and maybe one other company. Today, when you talk about tech, you don't talk about these companies at all. You talk about those hundred unicorns. You talk about Flipkart. You talk about Make My Trip. You talk about all of these new AI companies. So. It is completely clear that the landscape for the next 10 years or as many years as the case may be is going to be drawn by these young startups. Today there are 80,000. Tomorrow there will be 1 lakh 50,000. Tomorrow and a couple of years later there will be 2 lakh 50,000. But our goal as, 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 as a government, as a, our goal as public servants is to make sure that we have the largest innovation ecosystem in the world. We are the third largest today. We want to become the largest. Thank you, sir. So, going ahead, as we know, Bangalore is the Silicon Valley of India. So, could you share some reasons uh, in the emergence of Silicon Valley of India in Bangalore? And what can we learn? And does other countries also need to implement them? No, so, uh, look, I think this is a question that is being asked by, uh, has been asked by many cities around the country. Ki why did Bangalore become Silicon Garden, Silicon Valley, Silicon, whatever? I am from Bangalore, I spent, uh, you know, 35 years in Bangalore. And a lot of it was the fact that uh, there was an academic ecosystem in Bangalore, a public sector technology ecosystem in Bangalore, ISRO, Bharat, H.A. Easily allowed these new companies, new companies then, that is Infosys and the Wipro's of the world, to create, use the talent, use the capabilities to grow in the IT services business. Number one, Bangalore had the elements that required to build these companies. The second was most other cities were asleep at the wheel. Most other governments, I would argue, for example, that before Bangalore, Kerala was a pioneer in a concept of these IT parks by starting something called Technopark. 
but then they went and elected Marxists. You understand? So you have great potential, but if you have the wrong politics, the wrong political leaders, and you are back at the end of the... Uh, so I think Karnataka and Bangalore had the opportunity that we had the ingredients. We had some progressive uh, political leadership at that time that backed this opportunity, went full in, and therefore it grew. And which is exactly the point that in 2014, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji said, that we don't want digital opportunities to be concentrated in these three and a half cities. And I keep saying three and a half, and the three and a half are Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, Gurugram, and maybe you can add Pune if you if you really uh, push to it. That it should no longer be about concentration there, that every youngster from Baruch or Surat or Gandhinagar has to go to Bangalore to find a job in IT if he wants to aspire to be in the digital space. But that we must move that to increasing the number of tier 2, tier 3 cities that are also in the digital space from 5 to 15, 15 to 25. So that is underway. Plus after COVID what has happened is that with work from home, now a youngster in Baruch or a youngster anywhere in Kohima, Nagaland can also be part of this. Uh, this. So I, I think all of this is saying, saying to me one thing, which is that the history of technology in India may have started in Bengaluru, but the future will be written, the script will be written, the future chapters of innovation will be written all over the country. Sir, so moving on, like you are the man of uh, information technology and you have seen the whole era of how the technology has evolved and Today, India is moving so fast with this advanced technology. So what are your views on blockchain technology? And do you think that it can add value to the businesses nowadays? They can block. Uh, there are two things. I'll, I'll answer that in this way. The internet, which is let's say Web 2.0, and preceding it Web 1.0 has transformed everything. It has changed business models, it has changed government, it has changed individuals' lives. So it has completely redrawn what is the normal. Now think of Web 2.0 and think of another disruption, which is Web 3.0. Which is you take the internet as you know it and further decentralize it. And that is what Web 3.0 is. Now, I will say two, three things here about Web 3.0. We will move to Web 3.0. India will lead the charge into Web 3.0 innovation. But there are many regulatory challenges around safety and trust on Web 3.0 internet. Accountability on the Web 3.0 internet. How do you deal with increased criminality and user harm that is now today increasing on the internet? Because that the Web 3.0 makes it much more difficult to surveil, to identify, and to prosecute online crime. So we, I say when people ask me that the first, second, the first two waves of the internet escaped scrutiny of government and the escape scrutiny of citizens because everybody said innovation hai. So innovation hai to chhod ye, Facebook ko chhod do, Twitter ko bhi chhod do, sabko chhod do, ठीक है innovation. But innovation ke saath now we have discovered ki harm bhi hai and. Governments and citizens are now playing catch up on how do you handle the harm. So the conversation today is, for example, in the context of cryptocurrency is, crypto represents blockchain, but crypto also represents significant areas of concern in terms of who owns the tokens, who's issuing the tokens, what is the impact on the macroeconomy of the country where this token is being used or the cryptocurrency is being used. And therefore, the jump to Web 3.0 will not be as automatic and without scrutiny as a jump that we took from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0. There will be a little debate. The government debate, the people debate, the professors will debate that this was an automatic jump. And as you saw the crypto meltdown recently, 1.5 trillion dollars have been lost in crypto. 1.5 trillion dollars which is half our GDP, was lost globally on the uh, crypto meltdown. So a lot of people have gone bankrupt. And that is not a 
that is not a desirable outcome of any innovation that you have this type of volatility and this type of harm coming out of it. So I think the web 3.0 we will get there, but it will be a slightly more planned process, unlike the past. Thank you so much, sir, for your answer. So, like you previously mentioned that there are hundreds of unicorn currently existing yep. in the country, but only 18 of them are profitable. So, what do you think may be the reason of the other people not? Well, so, here is the thing, I'll, I'll explain to you that sometimes the value is not so much in revenues and profitability, it could be intellectual property. There are companies that are worth millions and millions of dollars that don't have a rupee in profitability or a dollar in profitability. But they have tremendous amount of intellectual property in terms of algorithms, AI, data sets, etc. etc. So that I don't think we should measure that through that prism alone. But I want to share one story with you about the importance of startups to the India story. I'll just share it with you. I know it's, I'm going a little off topic, but I want to share it with this audience. Recently, and I was telling Vasavaji, Prime Minister sent me with 30 startups to the UK for a seminar, do some program over. And I was there and uh, suddenly we got this, I got this multiple requests from over seven ministers from the UK government to meet me. So the first time I heard that, I thought, oh, I'm such a famous person, maybe seven ministers of the British government want to meet me. Maybe uh, being uh, Minister in Modiji's government has given me that type of faith. <laughs> They are coming to meet the startups. And on the last day, Prime Minister Boris Johnson invited the 30 startups, and I of course tagged along for breakfast. And he said to me, and I shared the story with somebody earlier in the afternoon. He said, I just met Narendra Modi in Narendra Modi ji in uh, Munich. Rajiv, tell me, what is the secret? How does he manage to do this? You understand? So, this startup phenomenon in India is today something that is being looked at with awe and respect by the world. Not just by the world's investors, by the world's prime ministers. And it is a phenomenon that is only going to continue to grow. And so, valuation, to answer your specific question, is a function sometimes of audience size, value of your brand, value of your intellectual properties and it is never only going to be measured by revenues and profits. Uh, so I have just one small question. Yeah. Uh, so when we talk about startups and we talk about leadership roles, if uh, there is a startup or let's say a company where you have the top, uh, the top three positions acquired by women, mm -hmm. do you think it's an ideal situation or what do you think are the role uh, ideas with the women in leadership and especially the startup ecosystem. Look, uh, again, sorry to uh, slightly divert, but I'll tell you a story that I love sharing with students. We did a program in my ministry where we invited thousand students from government schools all around the country to learn about AI programming. And then based on that AI program, we picked the shortlisted the top 100 and we brought them to Delhi to award them prizes. I said, the to their government schools. Now, you would think that the students from a Bangalore government school or a Gandhinagar government school, or, they would accept. But actually, the girl who won the first prize, if you hear that story, you'll answer your question, because that is the future. The girl was a daughter of a farmer. No computer background in her family or anywhere around her vicinity. Her name was Nandini Kushwa. She is from a government school in Ladakhpur, UP. And she does an AI program using open source data sets that uses, allows a phone captured image of a plant to be used as input into that program. And the program would tell what is it short of? Is it is it water deficit? Is it potassium deficit? Is it uh, magnesium deficit? Is it urea deficit? And it will spit it out. Now, so to your question about women leadership, look, technology is the one area where men-women ratio is almost one is to one. 
is about 1.2 is to 1. So it's about 54% to 46% is the scatter. It is the one area where there is absolute equivalence in opportunity and performance. There's absolutely no uh, difference. In the startup space, that is a little different. That women startup uh, leaders haven't succeeded, but recently Naika, uh, she's done a fabulous job, very sustainable business. So I think it's only a matter of time. There is nothing in my opinion that stops a woman or a young girl from having the same type of success that a young uh, boy or a young man is having in startups. Uh, like I said, this is, these are early days. The, the race is only, that is a 10,000 meter race, we have only finished 100 meters. Or 100 meters ke baad, humare 100 yield baad go rahe. Uske baad, abhi 9,000 meters left, in which all kinds of other rebalancing will happen. So, so uh, we have the theme today, New India for Young India, related to that, as you were part of the parliament itself. So, what do you think, uh, how the government uh, uh, puts efforts and the perspectives towards technology and entrepreneurship over the years? Uh, look, I mean, I, I know I'm a, I'm a member of the Modi team and I'm a BJP MP and therefore you expect me to be biased a little bit. But frankly... I have been uh, over 30 years in technology in India and I have seen many uh, leaders and political leaders talk of technology. But I have never seen this kind of decisive transformation in government, in democracy, in innovation, in economy on the back of technology as we have seen in the last year. And the simple proof that I will give you is for decades, the narrative of India was, the uh, narrative of Indian democracy was, as was famously described by Rajiv Gandhi in 1985, that 100 rupees were out of Delhi, 15 rupees were out of the account of the beneficiaries or the This was the narrative of Bodhi. What happens in today's day? DBT Jandan Yojana, so rupees nikal de Delhi se ya Gandhi Nagar se account pe pahunchta hai immediately immediately without leakage without corruption and absolutely instantaneously. So technology has been used in India by the Prime Minister's vision in ways that are absolutely more than just startups and opportunities and billionaires in actually changing your life and my life and more importantly building. A credibility and trust between citizen and government, which all was never there in this country. Hamesha lo kete de ki, are sarkar, ya to chor hai, ya to chori kate ki, amare pandra rupe me, to mujo hame malum hai, ki pachasi rupe kisne khalia hai. Aaj ke din me koi khana nahi, koi pina nahi, paisa straight, aap ke account me, or aap ke phone me SMS notification. That is the problem. Sir, so uh, as we have uh, built the first technological uh, mobile network BPL and the mobile company BPL in 1990, uh, 1994 and nowadays the technology is moving at so fast pace that we have 5G on our books. Correct. So, yeah. Hello. Yeah, so we have 5G on our doorsteps and anytime soon we can experience 5G on our mobile handsets too. So, how do you think that 5G can change the technology landscape of India? So, two things I want to tell you about 5G era of India and the pre-5G era. I am a person who operated in 2G, 2.5G, 3G. And I said this again earlier in the morning in Baruch, that not one piece of equipment that when we built out the networks were equipped. Pura ka pura imported. Means short of the screw and the screwdriver, everything else is important. That was how it was till recently. That every piece of technology that went into our wireless networks were important. In the 5G era, for the first time, a large percentage of the network and the whole virtualization and what we call the virtualized radio access networks will be Indian designed and made in India. 
this is a huge, huge uh, inflection point in the development of our capabilities. Second is, 5G does things to the internet that people can't even imagine today. Today, if somebody tells you, boss, I'll tell you, 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 I'll one of them is mapping motion, one of them is mapping temperature, one of them is ma mapping uh, uh, something else. So, you will have 5G becoming the fifth generation of peer-to-peer, person-to-person network, but it is the first generation of machine-to-machine -machine and first generation of machine-to-person network. So, the kinds of applications that will arise out of that, IoT, Everybody talks about IoT, but what about intelligent IoT? What are the risks that will come out of that? What will be the application for that? I think the next two, three years is just very, very ripe for innovation in the system. So, when I electronics and communication students, ko jab bhi milta ho, I say, you thought that the uh, sunrise time of electronics and communication is over. No, no, no. It's just beginning to start. It is like you've arrived at the base camp of Everest. And you are now looking up and saying, I thought 9,000 meters baki hai climb the mountain. Climb the mountain, don't take anything. So, 5G is very exciting time. And for anybody who is in the communication, sensor, IoT space, it is going to be tremendously uh, uh, exciting times. And it can also help AI boost. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole thing about sensors and machine to machine is that AI sits on top of that. If the sensor there says, Temperature is 28, then it does A, B, C. So, algorithms are going to be built on all of those inputs of data from all of these millions of sensors on the internet. It's a totally new world. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, like we've spoken that we've already moved towards the digital currency, the Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency. But uh, where do you see Indians adapting it and how can we ever move? Completely from the traditional money to the digital currency, or so. First of all, I want to just—I mean, I, uh, almost everybody who's young is fascinated with it because I have a son who's uh, 22 years old, and he tries to give me gyan about digital currency whenever he gets an opportunity. Is me two three fundes very clear can it be? Digital currency is not the same as cryptocurrency. Okay, digitizing an existing currency. It is very possible, it is very doable. We do it through digital payments, we can do it through all kinds of other models. And basically, it's basically taking a physical currency and instead swapping it and representing it in a digital format. No problem with that. Where it gets into a little troubling area is the crypto blockchain based crypto model, which is that if it is an unauthorized, non central bank backed crypto like Bitcoin or Doge or Ethereum or whatever, then it is essentially gambling because there is nobody backing it. And so you have seen the last three months, $1.5 trillion have been lost on that gamble. And you have no place to go. In the, in the real world, if your rupee suddenly becomes less valuable than 100 rupees, you can at least go crying to the government or to the RBI. So, here you lost it, you lost it, you lost it. The third thing about the Indian context in crypto is the following. Our laws are very clear that an Indian citizen cannot dabble in foreign currency unless it is with the express permission of the RBI or it is through what we call the LRS, Liberalized Remittance Scheme, which allows you to spend $250,000 a year on buying American stock, UK stock, property, whatever you if you do anything outside of that, you are violating Indian law as it is today. So that is what happened in February this year, when all the there was a huge peak in Indian uh, Indians buying crypto. The government very politely, gently pointed out to them that they, you are, you are, you are, 
लीगल है कि नहीं है आई आई वेंट ऑन एयर आफ्टर द बजट एंड आई सेड लुक गवर्नमेंट इज नॉट अगेंस्ट क्रिप्टो गवर्नमेंट इज नॉट अगेंस्ट इनोवेशन बट द गवर्नमेंट इज पॉइंटिंग आउट टू यू दैट व्हेन यू गो टेक योर रुपी अकाउंट एंड बाय अ डॉलर क्रिप्टो यू बेटर मेक श्योर दैट यू आर डूइंग इट लीगली बिकॉज़ करंटली देयर इज नो अदर वे एक्सेप्टिंग टू द एलआरएसएस वी आर बी एंड सो व्हेन दैट बिगन क्लियर एवरीबॉडी सोल्ड and it is because of that word of caution from the narendra modi ji government that many many indians escaped the meltdown of crypto or maine recently tweet bhi kiya ki aap logo ko to thank you bolna chahiye minimum ki humne aapko bachaya hai thank you sir so as we are entering in the digital era and as you said it's just the start so we are going to experience a lot and more uh so my last question that i would uh, give to you is that uh, you have experienced a change in your work life as an employee as a leader as an entrepreneur so could you share some glimpses on it that uh, what was the experience in the change of the work experience that you had i don't see any change in my work life honestly i i don't see it um i work uh, as most ministers in the government of uh, prime minister modi work uh relentlessly we are uh, we have a boss who is a hard taskmaster who our prime minister has a definite uh, sense of urgency about transforming our country and all of us share in that uh, sense of urgency so uh agar anybody thought that being a minister is a easier job than being an entrepreneur or being a techie it is not it is as challenging as difficult and it is also as satisfying but it's a different type of satisfaction it's a different type of intensity it's a different type of challenge as an entrepreneur i never got around to traveling around the country as i do now as a minister but uh, it's a different type of uh, uh, the, the, the fabric of the work is very different but the intensity of the work and the drive remains as uh, as intense as uh, as anything i've done thank you Thank you, sir. It was an honor to share a stage with you. Thank you. And sir, would you uh, share some suggestions or give advice to the students of all on how to lead a life ahead? Well, look, I, I didn't come here to give you any advice, and uh, that's not my style. But I would certainly share this with you: that India today, post COVID, is, and you, you should, you know, just just analyze this yourself whenever you have some free time and you're not watching Netflix or. Hot star or whatever it is, uh, or what is it? Uh, matchmaking two, uh, <laughs> season two of matchmaking. See my tapariya. Uh, no, when you got a time break from that, just think about it. That in the last two years, from 2020 February to now, the entire world, the China, the America, the Europe, all of us went through the same challenge. We had to deal with this virus. pehli baar in the history of man modern mankind all countries had to deal with one same similar challenge now you say yourself look at yourself and look at our country 2022 now and compare our country to the rest of the world we have voluntarily delivered 200 crore vaccination shots we have stopped the virus after the second wave we have become the largest economy in the world fastest growing economy in the world fastest growing innovation ecosystem in the world highest fdi in the world lowest inflation in the world and i can keep going on and on china is struggling with its fourth lockdown america is struggling with runaway inflation highest ever inflation in the world ever in the last 60 years they never had inflation like this UK has gone into double digit inflation for the first time and then you tell look at ourselves and say what is the difference if the difference is really we had a different government different type of leadership and our people worked as a team with the government whether they were people in gujarat whether the people in kerala whether the people in west we worked together to say we will fight this and win and we have fought it now so i am saying to every youngster today the world looks at us very differently with great deal of respect over the last two years the prime minister has thrown open so many new opportunities for youngsters the pathway for the next 10 years is all about technology innovation and some, i think somebody mentioned that this is about 
that Oro doesn't have, have uh, is all about, is about arts and uh, science and so on and so forth. And by the way, I don't mean digital is about technology. Everything today is digital. It sits on a platform. If you're a chef, you are making uh, biscuits and vegan food, you still need to digitize your uh, your, your you know customer facing platform. So uh, I, I would urge all of you to look at the future through absolutely confident uh, eyes, look at all the opportunities and really be part of this uh, uh, really mission to take India to become the largest uh, economy in the world over the next 10 years. When you become adults and old and you are sitting in a dais like this somewhere uh, 20 years from now, maybe you will be giving gyan to people who should say, we are the world's largest economy and we got here because the last 10 years we worked very hard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We keep everything in mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for such an interactive and hard to hard discussion. It is an honor to know your journey, and I'm sure our students will take an inspiration from it. Sir, I would like to take your permission to take one audience question. Audience, the floor is open for you if you have any question that you want to ask to sir. Uh, good evening, sir. I am Sadar Sada from School of Law. Uh, so, being from the legal fraternity, I want to ask, how long do we now have to wait for the data protection? And you are anxious about this, why? Uh, so, because we have, uh, in digital India, we have growing cases of, uh, you know, these. So, okay, good. Anyway, it's a good question and I'm happy to answer it. First of all, I just want to tell you, uh, what is your name? Sagar. Sagar, Sagar. First of all, understand that privacy is a fundamental right in our country. Uh, I was one of the petitioners in the case where the Supreme Court found that privacy is a fundamental right in 2017. So nothing changes. Whether there is a bill, whether the bill delay is delayed, the fact is your fundamental right is intact. The data protection bill does something very narrow. It basically codifies the do's and don'ts of the relationship between you as a citizen and an intermediary that the platform that is collecting your data and delivering a product or service to you. The reason the Prime Minister and the government and all of us decided to withdraw this bill is a very simple reason. The bill was designed in 2018 pre-COVID. It had a certain set of assumptions. When it went into committee, it became a very complex bill because there are many, many issues that are not addressed by the IT Act, which is a 22-year-old act, that then found its way into the data protection bill, even though it had nothing to do with data protection. For example, hardware should be trusted geography, data should be localized, or many, many issues that have nothing to do with data protection. So we said we'll withdraw it because it was clear from the public commentary, not from our assessment, that that bill would cast a huge burden of compliance on young startups. And the Prime Minister has made it very clear, we will never do anything by way of policy or laws or rules that will ever create hurdles for our youth or for our entrepreneurs. And this was creating a huge compliance burden. So, each, no, I'll just, I'll just answer. so the, to your question of what happens next, we will get a total framework of laws. We will bring in a new law which will replace the IT Act, which will address all these other issues, challenges of the internet. We will create a very, very specific digital data protection bill and we'll create a national data protection, national data governance framework policy for the non-personal data part, which is for AI and all that. So you will see that we will come with a total comprehensive framework 
that will be the catalyst for this India's decade. That means the innovation will go ahead as well as citizen rights will be protected. By the way, just one five cents, Naya Paisa of advice. Cyber law, if you're a lawyer, is an area where there's tremendous opportunity for learning and for succeeding both professionally and as a you know law firm. There's a lot of shortage in that area of, of talented young minds and it is an area that uh, I would encourage you to spend a lot of attention on. Yes, sir. So, might be expecting a question from youth, but I feel teacher remains young, you know, throughout. So that's why I am allowing, you know, asking for your permission to ask a question okay. as a teacher. So in this particular concept of new India for young India, uh, there are all of many stakeholders, you know, industrialists, people like you who are coming forward and sensitizing all of us as transformational leaders, then government, angel investors and many more people in the process. So I would like to understand from you that being an educationist as a part of education system, uh, I feel that uh, the role of a mentor is very important in this journey because I am educationist and many of my colleagues who are from the various streams and specializations as faculty. So how do you see the role of a mentor in this particular journey of skill development and entrepreneurship? Because I believe that we are going to play a very instrumental role in this particular process. So your thoughts on that, sir? No, thank you for asking that question and I think it's a very important question. <laughs> I think the role of uh, our educations, and I, I speak about the community at large, is a very important role because we are today in our education institutions not talking to students only about knowledge. We are talking about knowledge plus skills plus pointing them in a direction where the knowledge and skills can be exploited through entrepreneurship and startups. So, a teacher ka role, mere hisab se, has dramatically changed uh, from saying I'll point you towards knowledge to saying I'll point you towards knowledge and here are the skills that you require to have and here are the opportunities. That is why I have, by the way, I when I address the youth, it is important for me to know that the professors and the teachers are in the audience because finally at the end of the day, you are the ones who are going to repeat what we are saying. Now this concept of mentoring, I have a slightly different approach to it and I'll, I'll explain to you and please don't uh, mind my saying so. I personally believe there is nothing that I can do to mentor a young person, especially in technology. Now, maybe in law you can, maybe in arts you can, maybe in history you can. Because technology mein, per se, a 16 year old cannot be mentored by a 50 year old. Because a 16 year old or an 18 year old knows more about technology than a 50 year old can ever know. And in, the more we live in denial of it, the more mistakes we are making. So, in my first meeting in Ahmedabad, I think you were there and uh, I think Mr. Nagarajan was there and we were having a chat where somebody said, uh, somebody said, and he was an old, uh, old aged person, who said um, that all students need mentors. I said, uh, with great respect, they need our teachers and professors to constantly show them the way. Which is not the same as saying, I will teach you how to build a business. Main dark internet mein, main, I spent a lot of time roaming in the dark internet. And I don't want to sound like a bad man roaming the dark internet. It sounds terrible, but, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm on some groups and I listen to people talk about criminality. An average 16 to 18 year old on the dark net will teach us about the internet and technology things that we didn't even know existed. And I think I'm a reasonably smart person and I can tell you that every week when I spend some time there, I come away scratching my head saying, this ke mein mein so hi nahi tha. So, uh, mentoring broadly, yes, but I think in the granular aspects of technology, we have to accept that they know more and there's a lot for us to learn from them rather than us to teach them. Thank you so much, sir. I would now invite Dr. Meghna Nangi, Associate Professor, School of Business, Oro University, to give the formal vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Arthika. Honorable Minister, 
for entrepreneurship and skill development, electronics and information, information technology government of India, Shri Rajiv Chandrasekhar Ji. Honorable Member of Parliament, Shri Prabhu Bhai Vasava Ji from Bardoli. Honorable Shri M. Nagarajan Ji, Commissioner for Higher Education. Officials from GTU IHA, Shri Hiranyamaya Mahanta Ji. Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Digital India, Education Department, Government of Gujarat, and SSIP. On behalf of Founder President and Chancellor of Oro University, Shri H.P. Ramaji, Honorable CEO and Provost, Shri Suresh Mathurji, Honorable CFO, Shri Nair Bankerji, Registrar, Associate Dean, Heads of School, Faculty and Staff, and most importantly, students and budding entrepreneurs. It is indeed my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks to this galaxy of stars present in this August gathering and giving us an opportunity to host New India for Young India, Decade for Opportunities. Sapne wo nahi hote jo hum need bhi dekhte hain, sapne wo hote hain jo hume sone hi nahi dekhte. These lines of inspirations and motivation to encourage all of us, especially the budding entrepreneurs present here. Honorable Minister Sir, you have given us the motivation and direction to see some such dreams with open eyes. We wish to profusely thank you from the bottom of our heart. Entrepreneurship is a tough journey. It is a journey of ups and downs, delight and despair, elation and depression. What we need is a guide, a mentor and a friend who will not let us lose hope and confidence. We wish to place a special thanks to the startup ecosystem established for students wherein they can find all this and more. Today's event is one such inspiration to all students present here. Be a job creator and not a job seeker is the lesson which they will surely take from here. Honorable Minister Sir and all respected dignitaries, we would like to thank you for sparing your precious time from your busy schedule and be with our students in order to guide and motivate them. Thank you so much. Thank you. 